Today in the Matt Wall Show, Joe Biden is officially out of the race, but does he even know it? And how can the Democrats claim to be the party of democracy after pulling off a coup against their own nominee? We'll talk about all that today. Also, assuming Kamala Harris is the nominee, will she be an easier candidate for Trump to beat? By her own merits, yes, but she's never done anything by her own merits, and she won't start now. Also, the head of the Secret Service testifies on Capitol Hill, and a pop star reveals her plan to rent three wombs at the same time to have triplets. Yet another reason why surrogacy is an abomination. We'll talk about all that And more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Biden finally called it quits, but the left's assault on America is far from over. This election is pivotal, and you need the truth now more than ever. That's where we come in. The Daily Wire gives you the uncensored truth every day. We can't do it without you. Go to dailywire.com right now and use code FIGHT for 47% off your annual membership. Join us as we fight the left and build the future. Saudi Arabia recently ended its 50-year petrodollar deal with the U.S., which was the which has the potential to weaken the U.S. dollar. Since 1974, Saudi Arabia has sold oil solely in U.S. dollars, which was huge for our global economic dominance. Now they want other options. If there's less demand for the dollar, then what happens to its value? You can do the math on that. It's for reasons like this that I feel like it's important to diversify some of your savings into gold, and you can do that with the help of Birch Gold. Right now, qualifying purchases by July 31st are eligible to get a -a one-of-a-kind, limited-edition Golden Truth Bomb. The only way to claim your eligibility is by texting Walsh to 989898. Protect your savings by diversifying away from the U.S. dollar with gold. Text Walsh to 989898, and Birch Gold will help you convert an old IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold for no money out of pocket. Right now, qualifying purchases will get a limited-edition Gold Truth Bomb Text Walsh to 989898. That's Walsh to 989898 today. The President of the United States holed up in a beach house hundreds of miles from the White House was just deposed by tweets. There was no speech or press conference. There was no photo or video of Joe Biden making any kind of announcement. Instead, early in the afternoon on Sunday, Biden's Twitter account, an account we know that he does not control and likely doesn't know how to use, posted a letter bearing what appeared to be Biden's digital signature declaring that he will not seek re-election. About a half an hour later, Biden's Twitter account posted a separate message endorsing Kamala Harris as Biden's successor without providing any indication as to why the endorsement wasn't included in the letter. Biden's chief of staff informed cabinet officials of the news, and at no point on Sunday did we see or hear Biden himself. Uh, The man who won 15 million votes in primaries all over the country just a few months ago, the man who said repeatedly that he was going to run for re-election as recently as a few days ago, was nowhere to be found. All we know is that Biden has now abandoned the presidential race, whether he realizes it or not. If it was a shock to you when you found out that Biden dropped out, imagine what a shock it will be to Biden when he finds out that Biden dropped out. Following the attempts to imprison and assassinate Biden's primary political opponent, what happened on Sunday moves us even closer to third world status. America is lurching towards an unstable unpredictable system of government when presidential candidates can disappear and then quit without even appearing in public. And that's after the media and the party machinery conspired for years to hide the candidate's progressive cognitive impairment. This is all what decline looks like. And we cannot lose sight of that amid all the partisan political drama. At the same time, as abrupt and frankly disturbing as it was, it needs to be said that Biden's farewell was, in some ways, in many ways, really, a fitting capstone for his career. In his five decades in political office, Biden was never known for making his own decisions. He had no overarching political philosophy, no America first style trademark. Instead, Biden was a craven, spineless servant to the powerful. He was a man who did what he was told again and again and again. As a favor to the bank that employed his son, for example, Biden spearheaded legislation that made it harder for people to discharge credit card debt and bankruptcy. That legislation, of course, flew in the face of Biden's self-described status as a hero to the working class, but Biden never cared about that. He cared about following orders, especially when following those orders enriched himself or his family. This was Biden's calling card, and party elites understood it well. When Biden announced his candidacy for the White House back in 2019, at first, It went about as well as his previous runs in 1988 and 2008. Nobody cared. 
There was no enthusiasm whatsoever. He was polling behind Elizabeth Warren in Iowa. Then when Bernie Sanders won the popular vote in both the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary, the leaders of the party realized that they had to coalesce behind Biden. Bernie Sanders was a radical they couldn't control. Biden would do what he was told. But yesterday, after weeks of prodding that spilled out into the open, Biden, again, did just that. He followed orders because he had no other choice. And to make this indignity even worse, they got rid of him on National Ice Cream Day, if you can believe it. And you know that's not to say that we should be crying any tears of sympathy for Biden. Far from it. He may have just been shivved, but he's a guy who's done plenty of shiving himself in his political career. More importantly, he just ran the most disastrously incompetent administration in American history. He opened the southern border, politicized the justice system, oversaw the outbreak of war in Eastern Europe, a war he suggested he could prevent. And now he's being dragged out of the White House in total humiliation. Biden has only himself to blame for this turn of events. He could have could have chosen to be a one-term president a year ago, made the announcement a year ago that he's not running for re-election, and retained his dignity or whatever little dignity he had to begin with. Indeed, Biden indicated four years ago that his only ambition was to be a transitional president. So he'd already set the stage for that. All he had to do was say, hey, like I said all along, I'm not running for re-election. But instead, of course, he clung to power desperately, like all political leaders in his generation have. None of them have left with dignity. They all cling on to the very last moment. And in his case, he, he hung on until uh, party leaders had to pry it out of his cold, mostly dead hands. Now he drops out in disgrace. The media has a lot of propaganda, as expected, about how he's uh, doing a selfless, sacrificial thing and all this kind of stuff. But we all know that's not the case. We all know he dropped out because he had to. And he will be remembered by history as the old, doddering, senile fool who was shuffled off the stage against his will. That will be his legacy. Now, whether you call it a coup or a collapse or both, it all began in earnest two months ago. And it's worth going back to remember this. Uh, if you can think back to that long ago, ancient history, when Biden's handlers posted this video on social media challenging Donald Trump to a debate. Now, this video lasted just 14 seconds, but it included five jump cuts, which didn't exactly inspire confidence at the time. Watch. Donald Trump lost two debates to me in 2020. And since then, he hadn't shown up for debate. Now he's acting like he wants to debate me again. Well, make my day, pal. I'll even do it twice. So let's pick the dates, Donald. I hear you're free on Wednesdays. Well, that is a video that should be inducted into the This Didn't Age Well Hall of Fame. The decision to challenge Trump to a debate before the convention will go down as one of the greatest political blunders in American history. No presidential debate has ever taken place so early in the election year. They've all happened after the nominating convention. The previous record holder for earliest presidential debate was in September. And this Trump-Biden debate took place in June. Now, apparently, apparently, Biden's team decided to front load the debate early in the cycle in order to head off concerns that Biden was too old for the job. They wanted to put him to put those concerns to rest before he deteriorated any further. That is the benign interpretation of what happened anyway. Of course, especially given what we know now, there's also the very real possibility that Biden's team sent him out there pre-nominating convention in order so that he would fall apart because they wanted to sabotage him. Once everybody saw the extent of his decline, they could move forward with the process of picking a new candidate. And that's the conspiracy theory there anyway. It, it could very well be true though it may ascribe more intelligence and foresight to Democrat operatives than they deserve. I don't know. But, uh, you know, nothing's off the table at this point, as I've been saying now for a couple of weeks. In any event, uh, that process to uh, get rid of him is, is underway now, and uh, it's already completed. And there's a lot of very dark irony involved here. Because after lecturing us for the last four years about the sanctity of our democratic system, Democrat Party elites are currently subverting the will of their own voters. They're pushing the candidate chosen by the voters aside in favor of Kamala Harris, who's barely any more popular than Biden is. It was a bloodless coup. Well, maybe bloodless, depending on who exactly was responsible for what happened last Saturday. We don't know. But whatever it was, it was terrifyingly efficient. It took them only three weeks to complete. And already major donors have thrown their support behind Harris. Delegates from several states have said they'll support Harris. MSNBC's talking heads have declared that the outcome is preordained. Harris, who has performed 
performed so poorly in her own presidential run that she dropped out before a single primary took place. But she will be the Democrat Party's nominee for president. She is their uh, great hope now. Watch. But now the DNC and the Democratic Party has to run. They're going to run a process, is my understanding. And the process is going to be the goal of it is to be, make the vice president look strong and be strong at the end of the process. So that means that's what we're going to see over the next couple of days. We'll learn a, more, a lot more about what that looks like. Whether or not the Democrats, in some organized way, um, try to create some semblance of a primary rather than just endorsing um, Vice President Harris, we shall see. Um, but it's at, at this point, it feels to me like the the process is potentially nebulous, but the outcome is not. The process is potentially nebulous, but the outcome is not, we're told. And the goal of the process, we're told, is to make the VP look strong. Now, these are remarkable statements coming from the network that spent the last four years telling us that Donald Trump is the sworn enemy of democracy. They're now crowning a nominee behind closed doors. They're not talking about a debate or even an open convention where diff different candidates can make their pitch to voters. Now, that would be the process you'd expect in a party that took democracy seriously. I mean, if democracy is your great value, if democracy is sacred, then um, this would be a perfect opportunity to uh, put democracy on display. But evidently, it's not the process the Democrats are going to go with. Instead, they're treating the convention like a PR opportunity to promote the candidate chosen by the elites. And nothing like this has ever happened before. Only two Democrat presidents, Harry Truman and Lyndon Johnson, made the decision in an election year that they didn't want to seek re-election. Prior to bowing out, both Truman and Johnson had openly acknowledged that it might be a good idea to leave the race. Uh, in contrast, again, to Biden, who up until like three days ago was determined to stay in the race. Johnson gave a 40-minute long address from the White House explaining his decision in full. And both Truman and Johnson left the race in March in the middle of the primary season, giving Democrats a chance to pick another candidate. By contrast, Biden has insisted up until this bizarre tweet on Sunday that he's the best candidate for the job. Biden stayed in the race until mid-July. Didn't participate in any primary debates because the DNC wouldn't allow them. And now here we are. So now it appears the party has decided that it simply won't have a contested primary. There just won't be one at all. Voters will take whatever they get. And by the way, back in 2015, when Biden announced that he wasn't going to seek uh, the presidency, he delivered a Rose Garden address explaining why he didn't want to run. This time around, as president, Joe Biden is missing in action. I mean, it's all completely unprecedented, every part of it. But apparently it's also been decided that uh, Biden will remain as the president for the rest of his term, even though everybody, including Biden, now admits he lacks the cognitive ability and physical stamina to run for re-election. We have a president who can't complete his own sentences or stay awake past four in the afternoon. And all of our enemies all over the world know that. China, which has been eyeing an invasion of Taiwan for several years, is certainly aware of Biden's condition at this point. What exactly is stopping them from taking over the world's most important semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan tomorrow? I mean, whoever's running the country right now, it's not Biden. It may not be anyone. The party of democracy has concealed Biden's cognitive impairment from voters for years, and now these impairments have advanced to a degree that's totally unsustainable. And obviously, that's a massive threat to national security. We simply cannot have a president uh, for the next six months who has publicly admitted to his own incompetence and mental incapacitation. Now, that incompetence and mental incapacitation was already a problem prior to this. But when the president himself comes out and says, hey, guys, I can't do this anymore, and he stays in office, well, then we're entering one of the most dangerous times in recent American history, or not so recent. And at the same time, there are some indications that Biden may not be around much longer. Take a look at this statement that Joe Biden's brother, which was released uh, shortly after the Biden dropped out, Take a look at, uh, at what he had to say. Watch. 
CBS News had a brief conversation with Frank Biden, one of President Biden's two younger brothers, and here's what he told us. He said, I'm incredibly proud of my brother. Selfishly, I will have him back to enjoy whatever time we have left. He is a genuine hero. Country over self. It sounds corny in our cynical political environment, but he nor I are cynical. The goal remains the same. Defeat Trump and continue the work that Joe has done. So that is Biden's brother saying that he hopes to enjoy whatever time we have left with Joe. That's either extremely poor wording under the circumstances, or it's a sign that Biden has some kind of serious terminal illness. Now, for the record, according to CBS, someone on the Biden team responded to this claim from Biden's brother, and they responded by saying that it isn't true and that the brother, quote, suffers from alcoholism. Now, that detail would seem to be completely irrelevant and unnecessary, but this is the state of things. I mean, they're all just tearing each other apart. Don't listen to that old drunk seems to be the comeback from the Biden camp. Now, of course, if you listen to the White House doctors, there's uh, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with Biden, even though we all know that's not true. At this point, it's clear that a team of physicians independent of the White House needs to conduct a full physical and neurological exam on Biden to determine the actual state of his health. And if Biden won't leave office voluntarily, then he needs to be removed under the 25th Amendment. That's the constitutional way to oust a president who can't serve. What Democrats are doing has no precedent in history or in law. And by the way, when I say that the, 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 he should be ousted with the 25th Amendment, I don't even know if, that's pol- if that would be politically the most advantageous to Republicans. Because then you have Harris, who's now a sitting president. Does that help her re-election or her election chances? I'm not sure. It might not even benefit Republicans uh, uh, politically to oust him. But I, it just truly for the good of the country. It's just not safe. It's not good. At all. It's a terrible thing to have a guy in the, in the White House who everybody knows is incapacitated and who has admitted to it effectively. Now, if Harris is indeed the new nominee, uh, it, it, it would be, we, we should say, a poetic way for us to end this year of reckoning with the madness of DEI because it concludes with the DEI vice president becoming the nominee despite not receiving a single vote. The, the media is saying, oh, well, this is it's good for her to be nominee because the ticket, people have supported the ticket. You know, they say they support the ticket. Everybody knows you support the guy on top of the ticket. Nobody really cares that much about the vice president. So that, that doesn't mean anything. She has not gotten any votes at all. It's quite fitting that the first black, well, sort of black female presidential nominee was handed the job and didn't earn it. I remember that Joe Biden said he'd select a woman to be vice president, and he did. So he was just fulfilling that obligation that he set up for himself. Now, let's not forget that she began her career by having an affair with a powerful man 30 years older than she is. So she's never earned anything through her own merit. And this nomination, if it happens, will be no different. Democrats can pretend this isn't true. They can call you racist for pointing it out. They can call you sexist. But it's painfully obvious that Harris lacks the IQ and the competence to lead this country. The Biden administration put her in charge of the border, which is a complete disaster. Then they sent her to Europe to help avert war between Russia and Ukraine. We all know how that turned out. She also suggested that it might be a good idea to abolish both ICE, the Immigration Enforcement Agency, as well as the entire concept of private health insurance. She suggested that terrorists like the Boston Marathon bombers should be able to vote in our elections. And that's the extent of her activities while in office or campaigning for office. And the rest of the time, she's cackling like a buffoon, talking like a child, or bragging about her pronouns. Watch. Ukraine is a country in Europe. It exists next to another country called Russia. Russia is a bigger country. Russia is a powerful country. Russia decided to invade a smaller country called Ukraine. So basically, that's wrong. Uh, good afternoon. I want to welcome these leaders for coming in to have this very important discussion um, about some of the most pressing issues of our time. Um, I am Kamala Harris. My pronouns are she and her. I am a woman sitting at the table wearing a blue suit. And uh, thank you guys. And my pronouns right. are she, her, and hers. She, her, and her. Mine too. All right. Now, as tempting as it is to mock Harris for being unintelligent and annoying, which she is, um, 
Republicans do need to be careful here. Uh, they, they would make a grave mistake by underestimating the potential threat a Harris candidacy might pose. Sure, she's an unremarkable midwit prone to saying weird and baffling things, but she's also young comparatively. I mean, she's 59, which counts as young now in politics. And she has both the gender and the race card to play. That along with a corporate media ready and eager to act as her campaign staff that all makes her a formidable challenge for Trump. I mean, it's nothing to take lightly. And once Harris takes over, of course, she's not going to be running things either. Her staff will. And the policy agenda of those staffers would be the same kind of identity-based communist ideology that nearly destroyed this country four years ago during the BLM riots, when Harris was raising money to bail out the rioters, by the way. During those riots, Harris uploaded this video on social media um, explaining her goals for the country if she ever took power. Watch. So there's a big difference between equality and equity. Equality suggests, oh, everyone should get the same amount. The problem with that, not everybody's starting out from the same place. So if we're all getting the same amount, but you started out back there and I started out over here, we could get the same amount, but you're still going to be that far back behind me about giving people the resources and the support they need so that everyone can be on equal footing and then compete on equal footing. Equitable treatment means we all end up at the same place. So equity, according to Kamala Harris, uh, means that everyone ends up in the same place. There could be no high achievers. There could be no students who get into good colleges because they worked hard. There can be no doctors who get hired by good hospitals because they're the most competent or lawyers who get hired by good law firms because they have the highest LSAT scores. Harris's vision for America is one where everyone ends up in the same place and where merit is irrelevant. This is an ideology that, taken to its logical conclusion, destroys economies, kills millions of people, destroys entire countries. And we know that because it's been tried before. But Harris wants to try it again because at every stage in her life, merit has been completely irrelevant to her climb through the ranks. And through a combination of corrupt party maneuvering and identity politics, she's now closer than ever to riding her own mediocrity into the Oval Office. Democrats know she's terrible. That's why they don't want to give you know, their own voters the chance to disrupt her nomination in any way. And it's why in November, unless we want to complete our descent into the third world, Americans must reject her as forcefully as we were going to reject Joe Biden. Now let's get to our five headlines. You ever think to yourself, how can I work this hard and still be in debt? Piles of overdue bills, the threatening phone calls, and never having money to do anything. It's overwhelming. If you're trapped in debt, Zero Debt USA is the way out. They've developed aggressive new strategies to end your debt permanently. Zero Debt USA stands between you and the bill collectors. They negotiate with creditors to lower or even forgive what you owe, and they do it all without bankruptcy or new loans. Bottom line, Zero Debt USA has powerful strategies that zap your debt quickly so you have more money in your pocket every month. But you need to hurry because some debt solutions are time sensitive and you don't want to miss out. Visit zapmydebt.com. Talk with one of their debt relief strategists for free. Find out how fast they can get you out of debt. Go to zapmydebt.com. That's zapmydebt.com. So Kamala Harris is, of course, not the official nominee yet. Um, I'd say her chances are about 99.9% at this point, only because it's, it's clear that the same forces who push Biden out have selected her, and they're the ones who decide. doesn't matter what the voters want. Um, And as mentioned uh, uh, in the opening monologue, already Harris has been endorsed by dozens of national Democrat politicians. The Clintons came out and endorsed her within minutes of Biden dropping out. The donors are apparently all in. She's raised like $50 million since the Biden announcement. Uh, The media claims that those are grassroots donations, which, yeah, sure. Um, But more importantly, as far as I know, nobody else has thrown their hat into the ring. And at this point, it would take somebody with real guts, like a a, a true insurgent type, to raise their hand and say, hey, you know, I want to, not so fast. I don't think anyone like that exists in the Democrat Party, at least not anybody with um, a high enough profile to eventually, to, to, uh, you know, uh, to, to potentially pull it off. So it looks like it'll be Harris. And um, if it's Harris, we all know what that means. It means that the whole campaign will be about race and gender. 
right? Vote for Harris or you're a racist misogynist. That's the whole campaign. And we all know that. In fact, it's already starting. I'll give you just one example of many from uh, the past 12 hours. Reuters has this headline. With Kamala Harris, Democrats would bet against U.S. history of sexism and racism. The article says the Democratic Party will be taking a historic gamble if it now turns to Vice President Kamala Harris to become its uh, presidential candidate. Betting that a black woman can overcome racism, sexism, and her own missteps as a politician to defeat Republican Donald Trump. Uh, In more than two centuries of democracy, American voters have elected only one black president and never a woman, a record that makes even some black voters wonder if Harris can crash through the hardest ceiling in U.S. politics. Will her race and gender be an issue? Absolutely, said Latasha Brown, a political strategist and co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund. But despite earning praise in the last few weeks for her strong defense of Biden, some Democrats remain concerned about Harris's shaky first two years in office, short-lived campaign for the 2020 Democratic nomination, and perhaps most of all, the weight of a long history of racial and gender discrimination in the United States. You see what they're doing here, which is very, uh, very funny that they're, they, they admit that, well, yeah, she's incompetent. She's done a terrible job, but you know, mainly it's that America is racist and, and sexist. What? how, so if, if she ends up failing and she, she's, and she loses the election, they, they've set it up so that they can, of course, say, oh, it's because America is racist and sexist. But you're also, couldn't it also be that people have noticed what you call her shaky time as vice president? I mean, that, that potential explanation exists, but we know ahead of time that if she loses the election, it, it won't be because of that. Um, and then it goes on and on about America's history of racism and sexism and so on. Um, so there are two things I want to say about this, and we'll obviously be revisiting this topic because there's a lot to be said about it. But for now, first of all, just to kind of reiterate a point, because I think it's important, this word of caution, that it, it would be very foolish to assume that Harris is not a threat to Trump, that her candidacy is a big joke, that Trump will win easily, and so on. Uh, we should not assume that. Yes, Harris is a bumbling idiot with no accomplishes, accomplishments to speak of, but that doesn't necessarily matter. The media, which still has an enormous amount of power to shape narratives, will set to work, as they already have, to shape this, you know, to shape her into this uh, messianic figure, you know, this savior figure, a woman who has come to save us from white supremacy and sexism and all the rest of it. And that propaganda, it's like, it's hard to, to judge sometimes because that kind of propaganda just falls totally flat, probably for you if you're watching the show. It obviously falls flat for me. I just laugh at it, but we're, that's not the case for everybody. There's plenty of people in this country who will see that and be convinced by it and, um, and will be successfully energized because of it. You know, I've heard the claim, very common claim on the right anyway, that, that actually a Harris, a Harris campaign will be easier for Trump to beat than Biden. But I think that that's, I don't think that's correct. Now, uh, Harris of 2024 would be easier to beat than Biden of 2020 or Biden of 2016 if he had gotten in. Um, That's true. But Trump wasn't running against that Biden, but Trump was running against the Biden who can't who can't speak at all. You know, we joke about uh, how Harris can't speak, but she can't, I mean, she can't actually, what she's saying doesn't make any sense, but she can't actually get the words out. So she's got that going for her at least. Um, But I think more importantly, there was just, there was just no, like with Biden re-election, there was, there was no energy. There was no enthusiasm. Um, The media couldn't even find a way to generate enthusiasm, as we know, which is why they gave up on him and pushed him out instead. With Harris, yeah, by all rights, by all merits, there's nothing to be excited about. But there are certain things here that the media can latch on to to try to generate excitement um, in a totally artificial, disingenuous way. But there's there's something there. And it's really, it's all about just identity. It's woman, not white, young, you know, again, 59, but young by comparison. So we have, to, we have to be realists about it. I'm seeing a lot of anti-realism on social media right now. For example, Kim Klasik, um 
tweeted yesterday that that uh, President Trump will garner a larger portion of the black vote than Harris will, which is just fantasy. Okay, it's wish casting. A Republican nominee hasn't even come close to that in generations. The idea that one will finally pull it off while running against a non-white female is just pure delusion. It's not going to happen. You have to understand and acknowledge that. Not because we want to be pessimistic or fatalistic, not because we're conceding defeat, obviously. Uh, All the smart money is still on Trump in this thing. Don't get me wrong, but we have to be realistic about it because we have to employ an effective strategy that is grounded in reality. And there is no effective strategy except one that is grounded in reality. And um, that brings me to the second point, which which is this, that Harris's whole campaign will be about diversity right? Race and gender, diversity, equity, inclusion. I mean, it will be the DEI campaign. Um, Also, abortion is going to be a big part of it, which falls into the gender category for them. And the Republican instinct, and I'm already seeing some of this, and this is what worries me, because the Republican instinct will be to pander even more to women and minorities in order to counteract all of that. Right, but that, that's the wrong move. That's a losing battle. That is a fool's errand. You are not going to out pander a minority female Democrat politician. You're not going to do it. You cannot win that pandering battle. You just can't. It's not possible. And if you try, you'll be fighting the battle on her field, on her terms, the way that she wants. You'd be doing her a massive favor. You know, if, by, if, if Trump comes out and says, no, I'm, the one, I'm really the one who's, uh, who, who, uh, who, who cares the most about uh, black people and minorities, it's me, like that kind of thing. Trump comes out with that. Harris is sitting there like, thank God. Thank God this is the, this is the tact he's taking. She wouldn't be thanking God, but whoever she thinks. Um, you can't win that way. So rather than pander, now, does that mean that you come out and say, ah, oh, we don't need we don't need any votes from women and black people? No, thanks. Obviously not. But no, you just don't pander. This is this is all the more reason to not do it. That. It's all the more reason to not run around like bragging about all the quote unquote black jobs you created while saying nothing about white jobs. Right. Like listing all the groups you're helping, but specifically not mentioning white people. That's what I mean by the pandering. OK, and that kind of tactic I don't think it, it, it's a, a, an effective tactic, even if you're running against Joe Biden, but against Kamala Harris especially isn't. Um, so let her run the race and gender pandering campaign. She can have that. And Republicans should run a campaign that isn't about any of that. A campaign that's actually about Americans. But we're not breaking it down into groups but you're just running for Americans, Americans who, who call this place their homeland, like J.D. Vance said in his, uh, in his speech at the convention. Make that your campaign. Um, which is, for the most part, essentially, of course, as we heard in the Vance's campaign speech, like that is, that's already a big part of the message, which is good. But I'm just worried about this what we know historically has been the Republican uh, instinct to see this pandering game going on and thinking, well, we can, we can, we can, two can play at that game. No, they can't. They can't. All right. Um, speaking of pandering, here's the, uh, the hill. Top security officials defended women being in the U.S. Secret Service in a Saturday statement following the assassination attempt on former President Trump. Alejandro Mayorkas uh, put out a statement that he's the Homeland Security Secretary saying, in the days following the attempted assassination of former President Trump, some people have made public statements questioning the presence of women in law enforcement, including the United States Secret Service. These assertions are baseless and insulting. The Secret Service has faced scrutiny uh, in the wake of the assassination attempt against Trump last weekend, with some questioning how the gunman had access to a roof that had clear line of sight to the former president. Statement continues, every single day in communities big and small across our great country, women are serving in federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, and campus law enforcement. They're highly trained and skilled professionals who risk their lives on the front lines for the safety and security of others. They are brave and selfless patriots who deserve our gratitude and respect. 
We in the United States Department of Homeland Security will, with great pride, focus, and devotion to mission, continue to recruit, retain, and elevate women in our law enforcement ranks. Our department will be the better for it and our country more secure. Now, we've talked about this several times over the past week. The fact that they have unqualified women on the Secret Service is insane. The fact that they're focused on defending their diversity efforts at a time like this is also insane. We don't need to rehash all of that. Instead, I just want to say this. And, and let me offer this, uh, this thought, or maybe more of a... It's an opportunity, I think. Here's an opportunity that I want to throw out there. So Secret Service protection is granted to all presidents and former presidents. In theory, uh, the living ones anyway, right? And, you know, once they died, it's kind of a moot point. And that means that there are three Democrats currently getting Secret Service protection, not counting, well, you know, we won't count Jimmy Carter. We'll leave him out of this. Uh, Biden, Obama, Clinton. So here's the opportunity. If female Secret Service agents are really just as capable as men, then that means that you could assemble a highly capable all-female Secret Service detail. It'll be just as good as the all-male details. And uh, in which case, you should assemble three all-female Secret Service details, and you should assign them to the Bidens, the Obamas, and the Clintons. Let's give them you know, all-female Secret Service protection, consisting only of badass, kick-ass women, you know, and... Uh, We'll just test out these girl power theories and see what happens. Why not? They should all jump at this chance, shouldn't they? We know Bill Clinton will jump at it, maybe for different reasons. He's all in. We know that. And the others should be too, because women are just as capable as men. We know they're all, there, there have historically been, and even now, there are uh, uh, all, all male Secret Service details. And... Nobody ever worries about that. I mean, nobody would ever look at their security and see it's only men and say, well, this makes me feel unsafe. I, I, we need to get more women in here. Nobody would ever say that. But, which really, that, that alone tells you everything you need to know. But if men and women are exactly the same and women are just as capable, then, then you know, if you did uh, find yourself surrounded only by women doing security for you, then you, you should be happy about that. Really. So let's just, let's do it and, uh, and, as I said, see what happens. Just test it out. A little, little experiment. And I think that these um, very progressive presidents and former presidents who believe so much in the feminist ideals, um, that they should be really excited about it. Speaking of Secret Service, the head of the agency, Kim Cheadle, who should have been fired se seven days ago but still has not been fired, is uh, testifying today in front of a House committee, and the, the testimony is still ongoing as I speak. So I'll have a fuller analysis tomorrow when it's over. But for now, I want to play just one quick clip that, from what I've seen, kind of summarizes the whole thing at this point. Here it is. Watch. Day of the attempted assassination and leading up to that day, let's start with the building that the shooter used to shoot President Trump from. At any point Saturday... Did the Secret Service have an agent on top of that roof? Sir, I'm sure as you can imagine that we are just nine days out from this uh, incident and there's still an ongoing investigation. And so I want to make sure that any information that we are providing so, to you so, is so factual. You, you can't, okay. Why did the Secret Service not, can you answer why the Secret Service didn't place a single agent on the roof? We are still looking into the advance process and the decisions right, that were right. made. Okay, okay. Let's wasn't that building within the perimeter that should be secured? Do we agree with that? The building was outside of the perimeter on the day of the visit. But again, that is one of the things that during the investigation we want to take a look at and determine whether or not other decisions should have been made. One of the things that you said, I believe, in an interview, that there wasn't an agent on the roof because it was a slope roof, is that, is that normal and do you fear that that immediately creates an opportunity for future would-be assassins to look for a slanted roof? I mean, it, it, this is a huge question that every American has. Why wasn't a Secret Service agent on the roof? And there have been reports that agents were supposed to be on the roof, but it was hot that day and they didn't want to be on the roof. Can you answer any of those questions, Director? So I appreciate you asking me that question, Chairman. Uh, I should have been more clear in my answer when I spoke about where we place personnel in that interview. Uh, what I can tell you is that 
Uh, there was a plan in place to provide overwatch, and we are still looking into responsibilities and who was going to provide overwatch. Uh, but the Secret Service in general, not speaking specifically to this incident, when we are providing overwatch, whether that be through counter snipers or other technology, right. prefer to have sterile rooftops. I'm here to answer questions. This is a, uh, I'm supposed to be offering a testimony, but, um, but I'm not going to get into answering any questions today. Which, of course, it, it's all a complete joke. This is total bullshit, the whole thing. The idea that she doesn't know nine days later if there was an agent on the roof is nonsense. Uh, she, they, know it. they know everything at this point. They know everything. And they very well know a lot more than they'll ever tell us. Well, they certainly know a lot more than they'll ever tell us. But, uh, you know, what exactly they know, that's the point. We'll, we'll, we will never know for sure. But whatever it is, they know exactly what happened. Um, especially if it's exactly what they claim that this was a lone wolf, crazy shooter guy who just showed up and for no reason did this, then that's, it's actually not very complicated in that case. They probably knew everything within like 24 hours, but certainly basic questions like where was everybody on the payroll, all the security agents, where were they? Was anybody at any point on that rooftop, the one that the sniper used? Of course they know that. So she's still stonewalling. She's still lying. Um, The idea that the roof 150 yards away is outside the perimeter is also nonsense. And if it's true, it doesn't help anything because all it means, like whether or not it was in the perimeter, it should have been. So if it was, if you drew a perimeter that, does not include a rooftop with a direct line of sight to the stage 150 yards away, then you're even more incompetent than we thought. Let's put it that way. What do you think the perimeter is? Is the perimeter just all of the people who can make direct physical contact you know, with the person you're protecting? Is, is that the perimeter? No, the perimeter should be any the the whole the whole radius where if somebody is within that radius, they could do harm to the person you're protecting. 150 yards away, uh, yes, you can do enormous harm as we've seen. So um, whether the whole hearing went like this, where she answered no questions, I'm not sure at this point. But I but it, it's I I would guess yes. If you're not going to answer those questions, then she's not going to answer anything. And the very frustrating thing is that, yes, she should be out of a job. She should be fired. If there's any accountability at all, then it should begin with her stepping down. But she could just not step down, and there's nothing we can do about it. Right now, anyway. This is, the, this is what the bureaucracy is set up to do, to protect people like her. So this is not... The fact that somebody like this can escape accountability in this giant bureaucracy, that is not a, uh, you know, a side effect of having a big bureaucracy. It's, why, it's the point. It's why the bureaucracy exists, to protect people like this. Um, and to add insult to injury, she's still going out saying, hey, the buck stops with me. I, I take full accountability for this. I accept responsibility. Well, no, you don't. So you accept responsibility, but you will not suffer any repercussions whatsoever, that is not accepting responsibility. It's like if your, your kid does something, misbehaves, and, and, and you talk to him about it. They say, I, t- I take full responsibility. I, sh- I shouldn't have done it. And you say, okay, well, you're punished. Go to your room. Well, I, no, I don't. Because why are you sending me to my room? I don't want to go to my... Okay, well, so you're not ready to take responsibility then, it would seem. Same idea here, but... On a much larger scale, of course. Uh, let's finish with this. Rosie O'Donnell, for some reason, uh, we're going to finish with that. She, she has some concerns about a Trump presidency. Uh, it may shock you to learn. Watch. The whole thing is uh, very, very unnerving. It's very unnerving. In 100 days, you know, people are saying to me, my therapist actually said to me, well, it's a long time between now and November. No, it isn't. We're about to start school again. You know how quick all of a sudden it's thanks, it's Halloween, and then it's Thanksgiving break. 
So by Thanksgiving break, we're going to know whether we still have democracy in the United States. That's not a long time. It's a long time uh, to worry every day. I could tell you that. I'm excited about the Olympics starting. That gets me excited, so I'll be cheering for that. And uh, that's all I got today, people. Nothing big. Take care of yourselves. TikTok, you don't stop. Don't only watch the TV news. Don't, because it's... Listen, you can worry, 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 and it's time's still going to go, and what's going to happen is going to happen. So, you know, the wisdom to know the difference, the things I can control, right? The things you can't, wisdom to know the difference. It's all in that wisdom to know the difference, right? Drive yourself crazy. You can drive yourself completely bonkers. Believe me, I know. But boy, it's scary. Boy, is it scary. They're not kidding around. Right to an authoritarian dictatorship. America. Got no idea what's coming if he wins. And boy, it's not good. Okay. <clears throat> Anyway, <laughs> happy, happy, happy. Talk to you soon. Bye. You know, all I could think when I'm, when I'm watching this is that she actually, she's starting to look a little bit like Trump these days. She could do a great Trump imperson- impersonation if she tried. So this is just another washed up celebrity panicking about Donald Trump. Nothing very significant here. I do have to laugh at the idea of somebody talking to their therapist about their political fears It's more evidence for the point that I've hammered on so many times that therapy in many cases has nothing to do with science or medicine. You're you're sitting with your therapist and complaining about politics. So your therapist is just a stand-in for a friend because that's what friends are for or family. But instead, she's paying someone an exorbitant hourly rate to just have a conversation with. And you might say, well, if that's what somebody needs a a therapist for, then uh, fine. You know, maybe a lot of people in therapy really do just need a friend. Okay, then, but don't don't pretend it's medicine in that case. Okay, therapy in that case is like a non-sexual escort service. Okay, it's not it's not medicine. You're just lonely and sad and alone, probably because you've alienated everybody in your life, and you need somebody to talk to. Fine, I guess, but that's not therapeutic in the medical sense of the word. This is like those. Um, you know, those professional cuddlers, which is a thing now. Are we going to pretend that professional cuddlers need a medical license? Are we going give, to give them that aura of science and medicine? Probably we will if we haven't already. But we shouldn't. The other funny thing, of course, is just this fear that democracy will be, will be over if Trump is elected. Uh, a fear that is now completely untenable after what the Democrats have done. This is an... A- actually subverting the will of the voters. Okay, Trump has never subverted the will of the voters. Never has. Uh, he, what's an example of the voters say one thing and Trump insists on doing the opposite? And, of course, the first thing that anybody on the left will say is, well, what about 2020? He's not in office right now, is he? Did he have to be dragged out of the out of the White House? No, he, inauguration day, Joe Biden was in office, so you can't use that as an example. Um, no, th- this here we have this is what subverting the will of the voters actually looks like. And one thing you notice is that it's not just one guy who can, who does it or even could do it. That's the other thing about Trump is that even if he wanted to subvert the will of the voters, even if he wanted to be a dictator, which he doesn't want that, but if he did, he he still couldn't do it. You can't do it on your own with this behemoth federal government uh, underneath you. You just you can't. This when when it actually happens, it is a it is a, a conspiracy, an actual conspiracy among the powerful forces who run our government and run our system. Those are the people 
who uh, can subvert the will of the voters. And this whole thing with Biden is a perfect lesson in what that looks like. Some of it is in public. You can see some of it happening. A lot of it is behind the scenes. You don't see it. You only hear reports of it and rumors of it. And who is the they? Well, again, it's not one person. It's a, it's a, it is a, a group of people. And they're also not all meeting, most likely, in a smoky room and coming up with this deliberate conspiracy. It's more of a... Um, it's more of a hive mind kind of thing where they all work towards the same end. I mean, there is certainly a lot of deliberate conspiring that goes on. But when you look at what happened with Biden, you had uh, Democrat Party leaders, elected leaders, Pelosi, Schumer, Schiff. Okay, they're coming in to take Biden out, subvert the will of the voters. You have people who are no longer in elected office like uh, uh, Barack Obama, kind of the godfather mafia boss figure. You've got people out outside of Washington completely. George Clooney comes out. That was part of the story here. Um, and then biggest factor of all is you have the donors. So, and then, and the media. So media, Hollywood, donor class, politicians, um, kingmaker types like Obama, all of them together. And so even if you want to throw democracy out, subvert the voters, do what you want, be a, be, a, be a tyrant, be an authoritarian, be a dictator, you couldn't even do it unless all of these people decide that they're going to do that. Um, and they're not going to make that decision for Trump. We know that. All of those people hate Trump. And those are the people with the power. So not only is Trump not a dictator, but he is the least likely political figure, maybe in American history, to ever become a dictator. Because he is so despised by all of the people who actually hold that kind of power. And we don't have to speculate about that because those people, those groups, those forces just forced a sitting president out of his reelection campaign. And we saw it happen in front of our very eyes. Don't expect Rosie O'Donnell to under, understand all of that, though. But um, it, is, uh, it is clear as day, nonetheless. There's only one cell phone company that gives you free premium access to the media that you actually care about, and it's Pure Talk. This might be the best offer Pure Talk has ever come up with. Listen to this. When you switch your cell phone service to Pure Talk on a qualifying plan, you'll get a free one-year insider subscription to Daily Wire Plus. That's right. Take advantage of unlimited talk, unlimited text, 15 gigs of data, and mobile hotspot on America's most dependable 5G network for just 35 bucks a month, and you'll get one year free of Daily Wire Plus. The Daily Wire Plus Insider Plan gets you access to our entire library of movies, series, and documentaries, including Lady Ballers, What is Woman, Mr. Bertram, Run, Hide, Fight, and more. Plus, you get all of our daily shows uncensored and ad-free. But the only way you can get this special offer is by going to puretalk.com slash Walsh. I'm telling you to stop overpaying for your cell phone bill for a long time. If you haven't made the switch over to Pure Talk yet, Now's the time. Go to puretalk.com slash Walsh today. Switch to a qualifying plan and get one year free of Daily Wire Plus Insider. Joe Biden finally realized all good things, or in this case of his presidency, awful things must come to an end. But your chance to get a Daily Wire Plus annual membership for 47% off is still here. And it's essential that you take advantage. This election is pivotal for America's future. The truth has never been more important. The Daily Wire exists to give you the uncensored truth, but we can't do this without your support. Join the fight. Go to DailyWire.com and use code FIGHT for 47% off your new annual membership. Nobody knows what will happen next, but when it does, we will be there. Join us as we fight the left and build a future. DailyWire.com, code FIGHT, 47% off annual memberships. Become a member now. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. I don't know exactly what a Jojo Siwa is. As best I can tell, she's a 21-year-old girl who used to be some kind of reality TV star as a child and has now become, or is trying to become, desperately a pop star. Two months ago, she debuted a new pop song called Karma, which she often performs wearing this outfit and doing these dance moves. Watch.
As you can see, she's dressed like a villain from Power Rangers and doing dance moves. It looks something like a drunk, uncoordinated bridesmaid at a wedding. And this is what JoJo hopes you will consider edgy. She seems to want very badly to be seen as edgy and innovative. In a recent interview, she went so far as to declare that she had even invented a new genre of music. Watch. The genre is, I said it back in the day, when I first signed with Columbia, I said, I want to start a new genre of music. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, it's called gay pop. And they were like, what's that? And I was like, it's like K-pop, right? But it's yeah. gay pop. Yes, the revolutionary new style of music is gay pop. She's the first person to ever combine gayness with pop music. Prior to this moment in time, pop music has been renowned for its heterosexuality. I can remember growing up in the 90s when a, a kid, you know, a boy caught listening to NSYNC or the Backstreet Boys might be mocked by his classmates. You listen to boy bands, you must be straight, you damned hetero. This is at least what Jojo Siwa apparently imagines. That's why she's so proud of being the first gay person to ever produce a pop song, which is a bit like an NBA player in the year 2024 claiming to have invented a new concept called black basketball. You know, it's like regular basketball that we all know and love, except this time, get this, uh, black guys are playing it. Now, the claim may not make any sense, but uh, JoJo isn't worried about making sense. She just wants you to notice her. When I was eight is when Miley had her bangers moment. And I was like, all I want is to have that one day. Like, I want that. And honestly, since I was like 15, like my whole like inner circle has been like talking about it and like getting excited for it. I am shook about your look. Can Tell me about really this. really strange tan lines. It was really strange. Um, I mean, what do you want to know about it? This is my uh, it's my karma, karma. It's a costume from the official music video. Honestly, I just wanted to wear it again. I love it so much. No one has made this dramatic of a change yet. No one has made, in my generation, this extreme of a switch. And I am the first in the generation. It is very scary, but someone's got to do it. Biggest thing about this video, I don't care if people like it. I don't care if people hate it but I want people to turn their head at it and I want people to notice it. <laughs> Cause I'm the real lesbian, I said I'm the real lesbian, will the other real lesbian please stand on up? Make Slim Shady but the real lesbian. Yeah. I don't care if you like it or hate it, I just want you to notice it. We gotta give her credit for honesty, I suppose. There are a lot of attention seekers in the entertainment industry, she's not the only one. It's just that most of them won't come out and actually say that all they care about is getting attention. So the forthrightness here is something to appreciate, maybe even mildly respect. Unfortunately, there's nothing else to respect about this person, especially when you consider this story. Here's People Magazine. Quote, Jojo Siwa is sharing new details about her surrogacy plans. In a video interview for Cosmopolitan's If It Were Me series, the karma singer, 21, shared that she had specific hopes for how and when she would welcome her hypothetical future children. Quote, because I'm gay as and I have to plan a pregnancy much different than a straight person, I actually want to take three eggs, fertilize three eggs, and have three surrogates, she said. Quote, so technically they'll all be the same batch, but they would all be born separately. I'm going to have my surrogates, my babies, then maybe their birthdays will land on different days, and they can be like triplets, but like not. So she's gay as she says. That's the term she applies to herself. It's how she self-identifies, and I will certainly respect her self-identification. Would never dream of doing anything otherwise. She says that her gay status has led her to the conclusion that she should have three babies at the same time from the same batch, in her words, but by three different surrogates. Now, granted, she's speaking hypothetically about children who don't yet exist. She also has no idea what she's asking for. If you wind up with triplets naturally, then of course you embrace them and you love them as a gift from God. But no sane person actually sets out to have triplets. I've had twins twice, and even I look uncomprehendingly at parents with triplets. I, I can't imagine what taking care of three newborns at once must be like. It's the kind of challenge that you, you, uh, you let God decide to give to you if he does. You put it in the hands of providence. You don't go seeking it out deliberately. So this is obviously an, an emotionally stunted young woman whose brain is warped from having been a child star. Um, from what very little I know about her, she seems essentially incapable of expressing any kind of authentic human thought. Everything is a desperate attempt to shock and provoke. And this stuff about recruiting three surrogates at the same time is probably no different. Yet still, the language she's using reveals something about the surrogacy industry. She wants to cook up a batch of babies, she says, like they're uh, baked goods and not human beings. She's not a married woman humbly embracing the procreative facet of the marital union. She is rather an unmarried, self-described gay woman 
hoping to fulfill some very specific weird motherhood fantasy by engineering exactly the results that she desires. And all of the problems with surrogacy are in evidence here. First, most obviously, it is dehumanizing. There's a reason why the people who use surrogates can't help but talk about it in dehumanizing, bizarrely objectifying ways. The surrogate mother carrying the baby and the baby that is being carried are both products to them. They are objects to be obtained and controlled. This is human life as commodity. As I've said many times before, commercial surrogacy is the most direct and explicit form of human commodification since slavery. And that's why it should be banned. And anyone who uses surrogates should be treated with the same scorn as human traffickers, because that's what this is. But perhaps even worse, beyond the dehumanizing aspect of the whole thing, surrogacy makes parenthood self-serving. It turns the focus back on the parent, or the quote-unquote parent. Um, Parenthood, when done the natural way, and approached with the right mindset and with your heart in the right place, is a humbling thing. I'll never forget the moment when we found out about our second set of twins. Twins, um, If you've been watching the show for a while, you're familiar with the basic story, but we already had four kids. We already had twins in the past. We didn't set out to have another set of twins. In fact, when I found out that we were going to go from four kids to six, um, I was fairly terrified at the prospect, I will admit. Even more so having been there before. You know, we knew what having newborn twins was like, the sleeplessness, the constant crying, the feeling of being totally overwhelmed all the time. Uh, we knew what was coming. You know, we, we, we did not have the, uh, the benefit of blissful ignorance. And, um, and now we knew we'd be doing it with four other kids to also take care of on top of that. This is not what we tried to engineer for ourselves. It isn't what we planned. It's what God had planned for us. It was our job to humble ourselves And parenting, you know, the process of parenting involves many opportunities to humble yourself and accept God's plan for our lives, even if it was very different from what we thought our plans were going to be. And now we have two uh, more beautiful kids, and we can't imagine life without them. It worked out because we trusted his design for our lives rather than our own design. Uh, But the surrogacy designer baby approach inverts all of that turns it upside down. It puts all the focus on your designs, on your plans for what you want. Completely inverted. Your priorities are, uh, are, your number one priority is yourself, and that's completely upside down. The baby, or babies in this case, are mere fashion accessories. You're going into it with entirely the wrong spirit, which pretty much guarantees that you will be miserable when the actual realities of parenting every day set in which also guarantees that your children will be miserable. If your desires are the focal point at the beginning, it's likely that you will try to keep them there as you go on as a parent. And the more you try as a parent to keep yourself at the center and keep your own desires and what you want to do and your preferences, the more you try to keep that at the center of everything, at the center of your family, the more you will hate parenting and your children, by extension, and yourself. This is the kind of failure that surrogacy sets you up for. It's the, it's the failure of, of, of arrogance, is what it is. There is no humility in it, which is an aspect of surrogacy that I think is not talked about enough. And that is just one of the many reasons why surrogacy is a great evil. And it's why it, that is surrogacy, and Jojo Siwa are both today canceled. That'll do it for the show today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a great day. Godspeed. John Bickley here, Daily Wire Editor-in-Chief. Wake up every morning with our show, Morning Wire, where we bring you all the news that you need to know in 15 minutes or less. Join me and my co-host, Georgia Howe, for daily coverage of all the biggest stories on Morning Wire. 